Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin our session titled Memory and Imaginations, Reading and Conversation with Ruxana Ahmed. Um, kindly take your seats and either switch off your mobile phones or put them on silent mode. Participants of this session are uh, Ruxana Ahmed and Ms. Muniza Shamsi. The session is being moderated by Ms. Muniza Shamsi. Uh, Munisa Shamsi is a critic editor and author. She has written for several publications. In addition, she is a bibliographical for the journal and Commonwealth Literature. Has served as a jury member for the 2003 DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. A question and answer session will be held at the end. Please raise your hands and the microphone will be brought to you. Please keep your questions short and precise and refrain from making any comments or statements that will harm the audience. Thank you and enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it gives me great pleasure. Can you hear me? Um, hello. Again, it's working. It's, it's good. We're gonna have, I hope we don't have this problem. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Roxana Ahmed. She was born and brought up in Pakistan and she moved to England after her marriage. And she's now a well-known fiction writer, playwright, translator. Her many critically acclaimed plays for the stage and radio include Song for a Sanctuary about battered women and River on Fire set against India's communal riots. And both plays were finalists for the Susan Smith Blackburn International Prize. Her published stage plays include Mistaken, Annie Besant in India, a thought-provoking exploration of Annie Besant's life. Roxana has an extensive body of work and has also adapted many well-known books for the radio, including Women at Point Zero by Nawal El Sadawi and The Wide Sargasso Sea by Jean Rees. Both were finalists for the CRE Race in the Media Award and the Writers Guild Award, respectively. More recent radio adaptations range from Maps for Lost Lovers by Nadeem Aslam and The Inheritance of Loss by Kiran Desai to The Far Pavilions by MMK. Prior to this, in 1996, Roxana's first novel, The Hope Chest, was published by Virago, while another feminist publisher, The Women's Press, brought out her pioneering translation of Urdu feminist poetry, We Sinful Women. The collection includes the title poem by Kishwar Naheed and works by Fahmi Riaz, Sarah Shogufta, Ishrat Arfin, and others, and it is widely taught in British schools today. Roxana's uh, work is very extensive. She is the founding chair of an arts and literature archive, Salida, now known as Sada, and she has played a particularly important role in developing support groups for Asian women writers. On again. Hello. Hello. Well, we have no mic, and I don't have a voice. Um, Shall we, we, we put this in the middle? Hello, can you hear me? Oh, okay, this is. Hello? Hello, is it working? Yes. I think it's just. Mike. Um, <laughs> um, so, yes, Roxana has actually done a tremendous amount of work as uh, in support groups uh, to give Asian women writers a greater visibility in Britain. In the 1980s, she founded the. Uh, Asian Women Writers Collective with some others and she co-founded the Carly Theatre Company in London with stage plays revolving around women's lives. Throughout she has continued to write and publish short fiction which she has now compiled in a story collection The Gate People's Wife and Other Stories. It's going to be uh, out very soon. It's not available today sadly but um, it will be available in the market and it, the title story is an immensely visual story of the struggle and confusions of a young English woman who tries to ensure that Lahore zoos, half-starred animals, are fed properly. Uh, another story, uh, the intricate confessions and lullabies juxtaposes the lives of Amy, a disturbed English woman in London, with that of Adi, a young woman at a convent in distant Nasarpur, which made the crochet dolly that Amy owns. Most of Roxana's stories 
move seamlessly between Pakistan and the diaspora and revolve around women of Pakistani origin. Her story, The Treatment, which was broadcast on the BBC, uh, tells of a young, well-traveled Pakistani woman undergoing hypnotherapy for psychological problems. And in the process, she discovers an absolutely shattering family secret, which uh, makes a telling comment on social iniquities. Social disparity and class differences, mental breakdown among women, are very common themes in Ruxana's work. But her work is actually, although it is centered on women's lives, it is very, very diverse. One of her stories, um, Meeting the Sphinx, for example, tackles issues of gender, text, and narrative in British academia. While First Love links up a young British Pakistani woman's admiration for her brother's friend Firoz with her brother's passion for flying, which leads him to join the Royal Air Force. The story is set in a nation family in contemporary Britain and raises important universalist questions on war and warriors. At the same time, by the very virtue of Rukhsana's family history, it has a strong Pakistan link because Rukhsana's maiden name is Minhas. Her brother was Rashid Minhas, a young officer in the Pakistan Air Force who laid down his life during the 1971 war in the line of duty to prevent a hijacking and is remembered in Pakistan as a national hero. The story is dedicated to him. She is now going to read from a memoir essay in search of a talisman in which she tells of her life in Pakistan and her migration to England and the process of writing. Assalamu alaikum adab, everybody welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for filling up the seats. In England, we find the biggest problem is selling literature events. Here, it seems we are inundated with audience, which is lovely. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Monisa is always very generous. She's given me a very uh, glowing introduction. Uh, a lot of th I've done a lot of collaborative work with others, and uh, I think all the setting up, etc., was very much a collective thing, especially with the Asian Women Writers Collective. I joined it when it was a writer's workshop, and there were some very political women there who turned it into a collective, and I was part of that group, and I learned all, a lot of my politics, a lot of my gender uh, understanding of gender and class issues from there. Um, but anyway, let me just begin with my reading. It would be, uh, I think it will help us if at some point we shut the door. Uh, there are some seats up here in the front, please, if you want to find a, a seat up here. I really admire people who can operate in a noise. I just can't. Um, so um, I think, Muniza, you've introduced uh, people to the fact that I moved from here to London. Um, and I think I shall just read a so short section from the, towards the end of the, this account. Yeah, I think I can try. For a very long time, uh, uh, let me begin for just a little bit earlier. Uh, it's towards the end of the essay, so don't worry, I won't read eight, tons of it. For two years, my first novel hung in the balance with Virago's future, whilst I continued to work on commissions for the stage and radio. I could not commence a new novel until it was published, nor had I been able to extricate myself from theater and radio work. Its publication finally freed me to move on to my next book. For a very long time, I had believed that it would not be possible for me to write a novel because I could never capture my characters in English. I might not have attempted a novel in English had I not read Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. Rushdie had managed to subvert English for his own purpose. Her, he not only transferred the linguistic patterns of Urdu quite uncannily into English, he also demonstrated a strategy for transporting rhythms and intonations from the subcontinent into it so successfully that it opened a door for me, as I am sure it did for many other writers whose lives were split across continents. 
To this day, the most painful question that I face about my writing in relation to my living in London is whether I would have been a different kind of writer if I had remained in Karachi, the city in which I was born. I know I would have written sooner or later. I also know that success as a writer would have come to me much faster and more easily over there. It would be less than honest, though, to now claim that I would have that I would have written only in Urdu. My association of five or six years with the English Department of Karachi University had already nailed the coffin of that possibility long before my decision to settle abroad. Without a doubt, it is not just your style, but also the content of your work, which is modified by the choice of the language in which you choose to write. I'm sure I would have approached issues differently and written more about some experiences on which English imposes a silence. Inevitably, though, I would have been a different kind of person, too. Hard to imagine how different. I feel, a deep, I feel a deep connection with my past that cannot be severed. Even if I chose to exorcise it, that connection will survive in how others perceive me. That is easy to deduce from the treatment of writers whose work is deracinated to an extent and whose lives are distant from the real subcontinent. Um, uh, however, I know I, I know I myself don't want to sever my links with the past. It is the undoing and remaking of identity that has been the most transforming experience for me, besides motherhood, of course. And I do not know whether I would have grown as much as I have if I had not moved to Britain. To state the obvious, it is the moving itself that dictates the growth, not the direction of the move. I have a suspicion that people who dig their roots too deep and refuse to be transplanted not only conf confine the choice of the air they will breathe in, but worse, lose the chance to find the space they might have found elsewhere to grow and spread out unchecked by the strictures of the past. On reflection, I do not feel trapped by my identity or identities, past or present, or restricted by them. I use each when I want to. I'm not enslaved by any of them. I have the ability to negotiate what I want from each. The knowledge that I can, like a chameleon, call upon one of several colors, sidestep the preconceptions of others, and survive in both worlds, with a code that is not parochial or narrow in any sense, but works like, like an unfailing talisman, on the whole is a fair return, I think, for the loss of a few certainties and a false sense of security that is fed on an unwillingness to change. Sadly... As always, the talisman comes with the condition you have to surrender the right to belong. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a really um, interesting piece because it um, kind of touches on sort of basic fundamental issues, I think, of writing and writing when you're away and where language becomes really your identity. The uh, question I wanted to ask you was, you, you, you actually began, your first book was actually a translation, We Sinful for Women. No, no it wasn't? Um, no, that wasn't my first book. Which was your first? I think it was the novel that I started writing. The Hope Chest. The Hope Chest. Oh, I thought this came first. I'm sorry about that. I miscalculated the dates. Uh, but, yes, uh, but the... Yeah, I suppose maybe I don't regard that so much as a book. Because it, book, book. Yeah, you don't regard, hello, you don't regard, but it was the first published work. Actually, what I was, what, the question was not specific to that. What um, I wanted to ask you, what does women's writing share regardless of language? Because that was a translation of uh, poetry by uh, Urdu women writers. And of course, you were writing The Hope Chess, which came more or less at the same time then. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think essentially um, I work on the premise that women and men are interested in the same things. I've, uh, largely women's interest books, which are set aside, uh, and women's writing, which is ov overlooked with the description of it being feminist and focused on women's, women's issues, is dealing with a bunch of humanist issues. Um, it's, it's really how you phrase it and how they're seen. Some of us are more, some of us come over as more militant as, uh, than others because some of us are. I mean, I think it depends on how, re uh, how hardline your politics is. And I think I began from a fairly centrist position. I suppose I came to a recognition that gender was a problem by because of my migration. 
I was somebody who belonged to the mainstream here. I come from Punjabi stock. Yes, Punjabi was a, always a derided language over here, and there was this cultural supremacy that Urduwalas had. But by and large, uh, you you didn't feel that you know you were a minority or or you were oppressed in any sense. And I moved to a country where um, you know, uh, and I came from a mid middle class background. Then they weren't rich, they they weren't poor. I can't claim that I was. We were very hard. Um, we were not affluent, but we were comfortable. So um, I think moving um, from a position where you had seemed to have almost everything you needed, um, as soon as I qualified, I got offered a job at the university, so I was lecturing. Uh, and I got there and I found that nobody wanted to give me work. Um, I was told that the only job you might get is charring. Really? It's just like ha housework, charring. Because yeah. nobody wants uh, literature graduates. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and then I applied for a job as a neighborhood English teacher. And I was told that uh, you're too qualified, too well qualified for that, because I had two master's degrees, one in ling linguistics and language teaching and one in literature. So you, what do you do? But you start doing whatever you feel capable of doing. As I sometimes say that it became my corner shop. Writing was the thing I started doing to try and... Uh, I suppose, um, find uh, self-expression and get an income. And therefore, my writing from the beginning had also an aspect of um, a, a kind of career or orientation. I think I, I was driven to writing as much from anger as anything, and therefore it's quite political. And the anger came from my recognition that we had not had equal treatment as girls, as women in this country, ever. And um, I, I think that... that um, Injustice continues. Uh, thank you. Uh, the question I wanted to ask was, you know, you you got you, you you had just said you got together with a lot of, a whole lot of politicized women. You got into the, this collective. What what actually was the collective aimed at, and how did it change you as a writer? What did it do for you, and what did it do for the other women who joined? Um, it wasn't set up as a collective originally. It was set up by Ravinder Randhava, who's very apolitical, or claims to be. It was very much a kind of person who sits on the fence and says, well, no, 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 I, uh, writing should be, you know, all for the artist and that kind of stuff. But actually, everybody has a politics. Some of it is overt politics. On the left, people usually have this more overt kind of politics. And on the right, people tend to say art is for art's sake. So um, th it was set up as the Asian Women Writers Workshop, but basically because there were four or five very strong voices there, um, they start started saying, actually, this is uh, too hierarchical a setup. It should not have a coordinate. It, you know, you, it should not have any kind of rank as such. Let's shape it as a collective and be more political. And uh, I think as political events happen, I think it's because it was the 80s, the late 80s. Feminism was very strong at that time. So. Um. Well, in uh, your your earlier stories uh, were, I think, uh, reclamation and memory, weren't they? They were, you know, um, taken from I think what you reclaimed. But you know, say, of course, first love came much later. Your story, first love. Um, I, I was interested in. Um, well, how to what extent was it linked to your own brother? And you know, it does come later. Why does it come later, not early? Was it a difficult story to write? Uh, what were the issues involved? No, I'm I'm actually very self-conscious uh, as a person, and I'm very. Sus I find it quite difficult to write directly from my experience. I was asked quite a lot to write about my experience of my brother's death, but I found it very difficult to discuss in public because I think my politics were quite divergent from that. That you know, my position on a lot of the issues was very different from that of the family in some ways. Uh, my own, um, my own brother actually um, kept saying that the Bengalis were being treated very unjustly. Rashid's position was that. And uh, he was very dis disturbed about the fact that uh, his own instructor had been grounded. And it's ironic that he was the one who got picked on and he died. So um, I never wanted to deal with that subject, I think. Um, and I think very few of my stories are directly from memory. And I think when I talk about memory and the imagination, I think things get transmuted in, uh, in the process of writing. Uh, 
I started thinking about this that story, first love, because somebody wanted a book for a youth collection, and they commissioned it. And I said, okay, I'll write a story. And then I decided um, that I had to write something about terrorism. And when I thought about terrorism, actually, I saw that we were victims of it long before terrorism became such a popular word and po popular subject in the West. Um, what happened to Rashid was an act of terror, and um, uh, ironically, you know, our side were the oppressors. So the story is essentially a, a kind of anti-war story. Um, and my, I am, I suppose, I describe myself as a pacifist unashamedly. Uh, uh, anybody who would lose a precious family member, and he was a very talented young man, would become a pacifist, would be very anti-war. You recognize the in injustice and the foolishness of war and the loss of life. It's, it's interesting that all the peace movements um, and peace initiatives in the world have been led by women and mothers. So um, I started thinking about terrorism, and I didn't want to write directly um, a story attacking terrorists from a Western position. So in a way, I was con consciously locating myself away. Um, there was a very interesting discussion in this room earlier about the novel and the power of the West and the power of publishing in the English language and the, you know, how your location in the West can give you prominence. But what I didn't want to do was to use that position to propagate um, a kind of simplistic anti-terrorist position. Because I think that uh, whatever one might, one might say about fundamentalisms, and I hate them from the bottom of my heart, and whatever one might say about terrorists, one has to recognize that in the end these people have been brainwashed by vested interests. So um, I think that that's why I decided to make it a version of Rashid's story. It isn't that. So it's, it's oddly located. It's kind of in between. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know how fair it is. Uh, I love my brother as a brother, but I um, don't like the war machines. I don't like wars. I'm anti-war. I can't help it. Thank you. I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, your, your, your novel, actually, you, you had actually started writing short fiction um, earlier. And then, then, then it this uh, sort of uh, develops, and then you develop into the hope chest. And a lot of the themes in the short stories, it seems to me, kind of emerges in, in the novel. You know, lives um, circumscribed by patriarchal society, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, or whether you belong to the West. Um, can you can you tell us about how the novel uh, evolved? Um. Yeah, I don't think I ever had the courage to start a novel. Um, it's, I started writing a short story and it wouldn't end. Uh, so essentially it grew into a novel. And in a way I found that that was a natural way to do it. Ever since then I've been trying to write a novel which is very structured and I have never quite finished it because whenever I finish it I find something wrong with it. So it's still unpublished. I mean I've done it but I hope one day it will get published. But I keep taking it and playing with it and you know tinkering with it and editing it. Um, whereas that novel was just spont spontaneous. Um, it started as a story about a friendship between two women. And it is, again, um, interesting um, how memory comes into that book. Um, as I, I was writing about something entirely different, um, and then this memory just emerged. And memories emerge while you're writing, um, at least for me. And um, this memory emerged of a nine-year-old girl that we used to play with, the Chokida's daughter, who was married off at the age of nine. And that character, Reshma, was called Reshma in the book. And... Um, I suppose I never forgot the horror of it, uh, that, that she should have been married off at the age of nine. So um, th th that surfaced, and I think it, the theme that I was aiming for was some kind of an understanding of hunger and how that operates uh, as uh, an injustice in the world. Um, and I think it's, it has different kind of versions of hunger that are explored. Well, I... I, I I think a lot of your stories are like that. I mean, they take some incident, and ra rather than autobiographical, when I talk about memory and uh, reclamation, they are like that. It's a memory of a child or an image. Mm -hmm. And I think you change the, that into um, a story about social inequity or whatever. I think I'm right in saying that. Um, yes. I think that's how it works for you. I think so. I think a lot of my... Um, 
you you have a hope that um, you're not writing propaganda, and I think one doesn't uh, want to. You only tell a story that matters to you. It's just that often, by the time I come to the end of the story, I see the, a huge iniquity in it, and that kind of takes over and becomes quite potent. <coughs> uh, then you, you sort of moved away, actually, from... Well, not moved away. While you were writing all this fiction, you moved sideways, and uh, the Tara Arts commissioned you to write um, your first play, Sipor's Salt and Captain Smalt. Yes, um, that, in fact... Um, About World War One. In fact, I'd only written a couple of stories when the stage career happened, and that's why the fiction is actually much... Uh, less in volume than it should have been. Uh, been. I started writing plays almost in the first year that I started write, write, uh, meeting with the group. I think Tara requested uh, some work and they chose me and they commissioned me and I really, really enjoyed the experience. Well, what was the play about? It was about uh, World War One, Indian soldiers in uh, World War One. Wasn't that a long yes. story? Uh, yes, actually it was called um, Sepoy Salt, Captain Small, but it was based on the census reports. Uh -huh. of uh, soldiers um, that, you know, basically when soldiers used to write home, the British would censor all their letters. Uh, and there would be silly things for which they were censored, like, you know, uh, the goats have come home, and they decided that this is a code for something. And there's volumes and volumes of these letters that exist um, in uh, the India office library. Um, and it was Tara's idea. It wasn't my original idea. They wanted this play written. They sent out an actor's team to research it. And we all went and read those letters. And uh, then they came back and they improvised. And I'd never participated in a, in, a, in a process like that. I was just supposed to watch the improvisations. Then I was given two weeks to go and write a play, which I did. Um, and then they uh, re-rehearsed the stuff. Basically, I created a text out of the improvisation. So it was putting the incidents into a story or a kind of um, thematic um, unit which made sense as a piece. So it was a short play, I think an hour long or something, but it was fun to do. And I think the whole process is so external um, as a process as compared to a short story. Or, uh, poetry, I, I've never attempted. No, I did attempt one or two poems, but I was told in the workshop that's boring. And that completely killed the spark of poetry in me. <laughs> I think <laughs> I've kept well clear. I use other people's poetry, uh, which I admire, and there's uh, Tanvir Anjum is sitting here. She is, we're doing a session together about your poetry. I, I love um, the process of translation, but maybe we'll come on to that. You might have a plan for you, if you wanted me to talk about translation, I can well, do. Yes, do talk about the poetry. Okay. Let's do that. Uh, okay. So uh, that's how I, I got into poetry. But it was uh, the return to fiction was uh, sporadic. Yes. I basically kept writing stage plays about all kinds of random subjects. And this is what I was trying to say about monetizing your career. I needed to do that because I felt there was more space for me made for me at home if I was bringing an income and I could pay for the babysitting. Um, and I kept getting jobs in the regions to go and write a play about Pakistanis in the tin factory or Pakistanis in Cleveland. Who was, so I think, in a way, gradually I saw more and more the gap between um, middle-class Pakistanis here that I had the uh, experience and knowledge of and very working-class Pakistanis who had gone because they were displaced because dams were being made and, you know, wherever, wherever they were, they were, their lands were taken away, seized by the Canadians or the British. And they were told, okay, you can have a passport and go and work and drive buses over there. So I think uh, that kind of increased in awareness. But uh, fiction took a back seat. And during that process, while I was doing... Um, plays and occasionally short stories, a friend of mine, Romana, said to me, Ke, why don't you translate some poems? Your Urdu is good. So I said, okay, I shall have a go at this. And I started translating the poems. I said, no, 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 I actually don't really like romantic Urdu poetry. She said, Nene, the new poetry is really modern. And she brought me 10 or 12 collections and I selected some poems. And I think gradually the shape of the book changed. What, what, what does translation involve? How do you actually... I, I was uh, sitting in on a translation workshop yesterday. I was very fascinated by the choice of words. How do you, how do you get into English, you know, because without getting into stilted English, because it's, a lot of people say, oh, Urdu is just untranslatable, which is not quite true. A good translator is able to bridge that gap. How do you bridge that gap? How do you 
remain true to the language and to the language you're translating into and the voice of the original poet? Um, it's very hard. I, I don't feel, I'm not complacent about translation from Urdu. I found the poetry very hard. I did, a, I did translate a novel. I was commissioned to translate Alta Fatma's novel, Dastak Nado which is a very readable, very easy novel. In fact, I pitched it to them. Uh, I, they said that they wanted uh, a novel and I um, offered a couple of choices and they liked that and I was very happy because it was a, seemed like an easy text. I sat up and read it very quickly, uh, I think in one night, although it's a big, thick book, but it's very, very readable. Um, but fiction was relatively easy. Again, in fiction, you have you can have real problems. I've tried to translate Manto and Isma Chukhtai, and you find that words date. You find that there is no true equivalence between concepts. It's really difficult to uh, find the perfect word, and there's always a thirst. In fact, I've recently uh, polished some of my translations from We Sinful Women, and I feel much better about them, because I used to look at them and think, oh, this is not the right word. Because also sometimes you think a word is a right word when you're in a certain mood, and um, then you think, oh, no, actually that's not quite the meaning. And sometimes the meaning hits you long after publication, and that's very sad. <laughs> uh, well, I've got just a couple of quick, quick questions more. One, uh, one of your plays that actually has really fascinated me because uh, was also set in that 1914-1918 period, and that's, of course, Annie Besant mistaken. This... Um, you know, he, she adopted, it, it revolves around um, her home rule and her role in the independence struggle and shockingly to me, her support for General Dyer uh, when he shot up everybody at Jallianwala Bagh and of course the court case over her adoption of Krishnamurti, the sage who she thought she was, was a messiah. Uh, can you tell us about this play? Uh, because you did something quite new with it. I, I think so. I mean, I've, I'm very drawn to Annie Besant because I think um, I'm very drawn to the character of the do-gooder because there's something of that in me as well, I think. You think that you can change the world. You think you want to do something. I know people here, I can see Rahana there. She's, you do a lot of work in education. Uh, so there are lots of people who are unsung heroes who are doing a lot of work. <coughs> Annie was into quite a lot of power also. Um, and Annie enjoyed status. Um, and it, uh, what fascinated me about her was the courage of leaving her family, her children, everything when she decided that she um, became an atheist. She was married to a clergyman and her first revelation, she had, it's really like seven lives of Annie. She's got a biography of which is, I think, um, she's one of these women who wrote in the 19th century 82 books. 82 books. And you don't hear of her because I think she was such a maverick. She did so many different things. She was so good at different things. And she's so good at reinventing herself. So she became an atheist. She became a theosophist. She became a refor reformist in India. She was one of the founders of the Congress Party. I didn't know this. So that, that drew me to her. I was very fascinated. I'm very fascinated by the notion of foster families and how people connect with each other and how you might connect with people who are not your blood relations. And she really fell for this Krishnamurti child, uh, a 12-year-old. But then she, she tried to mold him into something. And so there were real issues of control. So this kind of split between uh, wanting to do the right thing and then not seeing the injustice of what she was doing. Um, interestingly, when she came to India, she befriended Brahmins. She didn't like Muslims. Um, she decided that... Um, <coughs> The Brahmins were the best people, purest souls in India, and really looked down on, on Muslims. So uh, I think um, I've been fascinated by her character, really. Uh, well, it's, it's a very fascinating. It's worth reading, other than it's not, it's not just been performed, but I, I think as a reading, it's a terrific text. Um, I, I want to talk about, because you've worked in so many different genres, that there's the translation, that then you adapt for radio, you've adapted plays, you've written fiction. What, what are the differences? How do you tackle each different genre? How do you da tackle a radio play? Because you, that's, you, know, you can't see anything. How do you tackle doing a stage play? And how do you tackle what, what, what do you gain in one genre and what do you lose in the other? Um, 
Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, I think you really have to learn the tricks of the trade. You really have to learn the craft with each of these. Um, I think writers sometimes like to pretend that everything came in one little gush. And I do have a story that came in one little gush, and that was the gatekeeper's wife. <laughs> so, um, and it was very easy and quick to write. But by and large, writing is a very arduous process. You really discover what you wanted to say by writing and rewriting. So um, I, I suppose I've had to learn the craft each time. But uh, radio is a very good source of income. Stage is a reasonable source of income. Books are the worst source of income. That's why they've been the... <laughs> I mean, unless you make it to the top and you're going to be a prize-winning novelist. Once you get there, you're all right. Um, so uh, if every time I got a radio job and I had to work hard to get them, really you have to pitch ten ideas and they'll pick two or three and then you develop them and then they'll take one. So um, I suppose I, I did that because it's such a good source and it kept me creatively engaged. The great buzz of a production, of having people read your work and, you know, to work with another person. I'm, I like collaboration anyway. Um, so theater and uh, the radio were very comforting like that. Um, but it is quite different from um, original writing because you have less control over it. You have to respect the constraints just as you do respect the constraints in a translation. Uh, you have to respect the intention of the writer. I mean, I do believe uh, that there is a core meaning of every book. Uh, it would be, you cannot write a book um, that um, claims Nazis were good if, um, the, you know, um, you're going to change its message and say, actually, the Nazis were terrible. If the writer doesn't say it, just don't translate that book. That's not you. You owe it. It's, it's your moral obligation is to the writer of the original. So I'm a very good translator like that. I'm a fairly loyal translator, um, and I think adaptation is also a kind of translation into a different form. You have to you have to make it work. And basically, I suppose with uh, radio work, you have the director that you work with, and if you are working with a good director, you get quite good support and advice, um, and you have to reconceive the work. So you might find that a work is too narrative in its shape or too descriptive, and it has to be made more dramatic. Ultimately, radio likes drama. But radio as a form is closer to novels um, than it is to the stage. Really? That's, that's, uh, that, that's that, that is interesting, yes. Yeah, that is interesting. <laughs> Um, well, I think, I think I'll ask you to read from The Gatekeeper's Wife, since it was one. <laughs> this is the title of her new book, and it's, she says it's a story that came to her the quickest. Yes. Maybe I'll tell you the story of how it relates, I suppose, this whole question of memory and imagination. Um, somebody was quite ill, my sister-in-law, and she was being nursed by a nurse who mentioned that her husband works in the zoo. And I said to her, really, what does he do in the zoo? And she said, well, he does cleaning, etc. And I said, really, well, last time I took the kids, the zoo was really smelling. And she said, no, it's all very good because there's an English woman there who comes every day. And she makes sure that the animals are fed. And the zoo has really gotten very nice and clean and it's really lovely. And I, I think maybe the following month I was back in London listening to the radio in the car. And there was a story about an English woman who had gone to Egypt, to Cairo, to save donkeys. And it's to save the donkeys um, that there were too many donkeys were being whipped uh, or some such. And um, really, I suppose I was thinking about the, the colonial kind of mindset and how they kind of more, they'll care more about the animals and the people. <laughs> so that was the starting point. Uh, when I finish, I'll tell you the rest of the story about the Annette. Now, I find because the book wasn't here, I didn't have the story. So I have had to, Manisa had to find me a collection. Annette, um, oh God, this will work. Annette, exhausted with the heat of the day, summer dress clinging to her body stickily, sat down to rest herself on a bench shielded by a grove of jasmine and hibiscus bushes as she trailed Hussein on his round to feed the animals. 
The heavy perfume battled with the odor of the animal cages. Water was a problem in the summer months, and the cages smelled foul two-thirds of the time. She was worried about Hira. He seemed even more listless than he'd been the day before, quite disinterested in the meat she, that had been pushed unceremoniously by Hussein into the cage. She opened her manual, wondering if they should be getting in touch with the vet or whether she should observe him more closely. She was fond of him. He was popular with many of the staff, too. It was they who had nicknamed him Hira because of the diamond glint to his eyes at night. He was as lively and mischievous a cheetah as any you could find in the Sundarbans. But this summer had really knocked it out of him. She picked up her bag and started walking slowly, unthinkingly, back towards his cage, her footsteps muffled by the soft mud. Instinctively, she drew back out of sight when she saw the woman. She had not seen or heard Annette. She was immense. Uh, she was intense, absorbed, circling the cage slowly, carefully, moving around the side, inside the forbidden inner perimeter of the white railings. Only the staff were allowed into that area. Even Annette respected that boundary. She watched awestruck. The woman had an eye on Hira, but she didn't seem <coughs> unduly worried. Annette almost gasped, gasped as she saw her lower her body lean forward and put her arm through the bars to lift a couple of hunks of meat and slink them speedily into a limp polythene bag. She was a tall woman, thin, lithe, her mission accomplished. She rose and dashed swiftly away with the speed that would have done Hira some credit. In the dusky gloom, Annette felt aware of a frantic need to sit down as her body swayed, liquid and weak. <coughs> She waited to collect herself for a few moments, wondering what had held her back from challenging the woman. Surely she should have yelled at her. That was what, was supposed, that was what she was supposed to be doing, preventing the pilfering and thieving that had been going on in the place. Hira got up slowly and ambled towards his dinner, sniffing the meat delicately before applying himself to the effort of eating. It was later than usual when she finally summoned her energies to leave. The men were hanging about the gate, waiting to wish her and see her off. It wasn't altogether unusual for her to leave a little late. She found the quiet and peace of the after hours at the zoo sustaining and sometimes sat watching the animals settle down as long as the night permitted. Darkness always fell suddenly as the sun dropped behind the high mud walls of the aviary. As the western boundary of the zoo forced... Uh, sorry... Uh, at the western boundary of the zoo, forcing her to drag herself slowly away. Are we doing okay for time? No, no I think we need to. Yeah, just do her we'll open the question. Uh, okay, yeah. okay. So today she felt drained as the car drove past the gate and she lifted a limp hand to acknowledge their salutes. Okay, sorry. I'm so, <laughs> sorry about that. We have got limited time because we it, it all got sort of muddled up with the microphone. We lost a lot of time sorting that out. So thank you, Roxana, for that um, sort of rather key moment in that story. Uh, any questions? Look at this question here. Can, can, can we have a microphone here, please? Yeah, you said you were commissioned to translate a work, uh, some work. What was that? Um, it was called the one who did not. Uh, it was called the one who did not ask. Uh, in translation, it's by a writer called Altaf Fatima, and it was published by Heinemann. I think it was '92, probably. Is that, one, is that the one you were translating from Urdu to English? It's Urdu to English, yeah. And there's one here. Can someone please, can you please hold, uh, see the microphone and see it gets to the right people? Yes, uh, please. I wanted to ask that you wrote a play in which you wrote about the letters that were censored by the British Army. So what was the name of that play? Um, that was called uh, Sepoy Salt, Captain's Malt. But it doesn't exist as a published play. It was, only, it was only commissioned by that company who produced it, yeah? Okay, I'd be glad to read it if I get to it. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Any more questions? <coughs> There's one here. 
You said that when you read the translation of the sinful women, again, you thought that there were words that you could have used in a different way. Can you give, give us an example of that? Oh, um, I think um, one of the things, uh, I think in the uh, title poem, um, uh, Kishwar uses a, a, a phrase called Ehle Jubba. Uh, Ehle Jubba. And I think we all have a sense of what that means. And I had translated uh, it, that as, as the ones who wear gowns, who are not cowed by the ones who wear gowns. And I think I managed to find a better version of it in the new translation, um, uh, which is, um, yeah, uh, now this is going to be a memory test, but I think I, I translated it by the ones who are in power. Um, because I thought that that was less clumsy. Um, yes, I think it's very, very difficult. Uh, it's a very, it's a business that leaves you quite thirsty, because El Jubba is so impossible to translate. It just gives you a visual image, and I wanted to keep that image. Initially, I felt it was more important to keep the image. Now I'm beginning to see that it's more important to be friendly to the target language, because unless your translations are friendly to the target reader, uh, they will find them awkward. They won't understand the full meaning of them. Anymore? Hi. Uh, there's one here. Hello. Oh. Hello. 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 <clears throat> My name is Jahangir Khan. Just uh, whatever you described and the, the questioners also, moderator also asked you some questions about, about you. Just it's not a personal, personal life or maybe general. <coughs> yeah. You have so many books translated and other languages and some characters you have picked from the common man. Only a five, my, my knowledge and uh, for the audience knowledge, you have learned the Holy Quran, which is the greatest book of all times in the world. Because you will find whatever you have described in the various books and translated. These are also maybe at a moment is maybe 100 years old, but it is 1400 years old. Where they can. So that should be its road that possible. It's just like your learned scholar, you should also read that Holy Quran and other uh, Bibles, etc. to and pick the story me, is for the common man. Is there it's my advisor, not I'm taking any No, excuse me, is there a question? I, I'll only take questions, please. Uh, is there a question? Uh, it's, certainly, it's related because she has, the learned scholar has given um, various examples, uh, just uh, like in Kishwar Nahid Ahle Jubba, that should also be described with very uh, uh, odd words for the other common men. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Yeah, I'll just take the last one, if there's time. Okay. Yeah, uh, so you were telling us about the difficulties of translation and how like there are different concepts in Urdu that are difficult to translate into English. So, in your experience, what is like the most difficult concept that's uh, in all word in Urdu that's hard to translate into English? Um, I think I think there's a whole bunch of uh, experiences for which there aren't words in Urdu, and similarly there is a whole bunch of things, details for which there aren't words in English. So it's very hard to be nu nuanced when you are trying to translate. So, for example, the concept of haya. Haya is a very particular word, which is particular to Urdu. Um, every language has, um, in Urdu we say mizaj. It has an ambience, it has a kind of uh, texture. Every language has an attitude to life. Actually, a language is an embedding of experience, into li experience of life into language. It has an experience of life embedded within it. So that becomes quite difficult to translate. So I think those kind of concepts which have to do with religion, uh, which have to do with shame, which have to do with women and sexuality, because as a culture we are very ashamed of discussing them. I think the gentleman is right. There's quite, quite a, the Quran is much more direct in dealing with sex, sexuality, all those issues than we are in our own culture. So there are various stories in the Quran. It's just that it doesn't capture human experience. It's not about human experience. It's a divine uh, for people who believe it is a commandment. Any more? One last question, I think. Yes, uh, a very small question concerning translation. Yes. And uh, I probably must have just came a few minutes ago. Uh, 
you said that you know you consider yourself to be a loyal translator um you know considering uh, writers who are no longer with us and you know considering translating their works like manto and everybody else so um how do you achieve that confidence to you know have that kind of loyalty as a translator when they and i'm speaking this from an experience uh, yesterday mm-hmm. that you know we were sitting with an author and we were discussing his works mm-hmm. and while translating it and he was right there in front of us to you know guide us mm-hmm. on you know what um, any dm in urdu means and you know how to so um, keeping that in view you know how would you define you know being a loyal um, translator i think you can only be loyal to your interpretation uh, essentially in order to translate you have to first interpret the work so you don't need the writer in front of you uh, writers often don't like uh tra- their translators as much as i mean they love them they love the fact that the work is translated uh but they're never completely happy because uh, there isn't a perfect translation that you can find i don't think in the world um so um i i mean i consulted with the poets i showed quite a lot of the poems to the writers of the originals um and sometimes they suggested words which i thought were wrong because they i felt that their understanding of english and its nuances may not be what it sh- what mine was so ultimately you the great thing about writing is you are the authority so you can say actually <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> this is what i understood from your poem so this is what it means <laughs> to well, me i think uh, i've been seeing that i think our time is up i think we could have carried on uh, thank you so much roxana it's been really interesting it's been great talking to you Thank you. Thank you very much Muniz and thank you for being such a splendid audience and bearing with us with all our kerfuffles. <laughs> <Yes. laughs>